So Paolo was with us uh, last weekend. Good stuff, yeah? Our Passion and Presence Conference. So good. God did so much. And I want to remind you, I, I'm, not a, um, I'm not a demon hunter. I don't look for the devil. I don't believe there's a demon behind every uh, bush. I believe that he who's in me is greater than he who's in the world. I'm not, I'm not like, I don't, but I'm not ignorant of the enemy's devices either. Amen. And so um, some people, you kind of experienced the crazies last week. The crazies. And, uh, and uh, sometimes the enemy wants to rob what, what happened. And he wants you to forfeit it. He wants you to forfeit. Oh, well, I guess God did nothing. I want you to agree with the enemy. Don't turn me down too much now. Hey, don't want you. And so, and so, like some of y'all had an amazing weekend and then kind of a crazy week. Right? I got good news for you. We got another Monday coming up. We get to give it another shot. Amen? We get to give it another shot. Amen? Don't put, don't like it. So if you've had the warfare last week, don't put too much stock in it. Be like, oh, wow, I didn't recognize the enemy came and tried to steal something. I'm just not going to let him do that anymore. Right? This is that simple. Let's just, let's, just, let's just move on. Amen? Don't start beating yourself up. You didn't forfeit anything because Jesus is still alive and his word is still true over your life. Right? There's a stupid little song called This Little Light of Mine. You ever heard it? Don't sing it. Let me tell you why it's stupid. Let me tell you why it's stupid. So don't sing it. Like this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And, all right, and then, then, then what's the next verse? Don't let Satan it out. You think the devil could put out the Holy Ghost? I don't know where you got your light from, but I got mine from the living God. I don't got a little flickering thing I got to worry that any moment now it might go. I got the flame of God living on the inside of me. And my Bible said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I just feel like if Jesus has me, the devil can't get me. So don't buy into some false theology that, oh no, I got to protect my little flame or the devil's going to it out. He can't take this. He didn't give it to me. He can't take it away. Amen. I don't think so. Not today, devil. Stupid song. Not today. Not today. Fool somebody else. Not today. Because he knows I'm after him. Hot on his tail wants me to be scared of him. I'm chasing you. You ain't chasing me. Like when you have a little kid, they're arguing with you, and they're like, no, no, Dad. I'm like, no, I don't know if you understand who's the parent in this conversation right now. Look at the mortgage. Come on. <clears throat> Got my name on it. We're not having a debate right now. I'm letting you know you're not running in the street. You're going to put on some pants before you leave the house, right? Like, you got to tell little ones sometimes, right? Going to snuff out my light. Come on now. Come on. About dumber, right? I'm a little worked up right now, but I do love Jesus. Shabbat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. <clears throat> if you got a Bible, you can turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 15. I'm starting a new message series today. Ha. Ha. Ooh, feels good in here, Chelsea. I'm feeling good right now. Bless the Lamb. They didn't even start my countdown clock. I'm doing good right now. Glory to Jesus. I haven't even started preaching yet. Watch out. Shabbat. God might even set you free today. Who knows? And the light came on. What? <laughs> Come on. All right, check it out. <clears throat> Can you turn down Mikey just one touch, if you would? Um, we're starting our new message series, Community. And, uh, um, ha! I made the graphic. You can go ahead and clap. It's all right. That's Boca Raton. And um, we're going to talk today about... <clears throat> ha. Ha. You know, God set us in this community for a reason. We're a part of this community. Too much of the church is running from the community God has put them in. And uh, he's not going to snuff out our little light. It's going to set a fire in Boca Raton, amen? Come on. You can't hide your flame and let it start a fire. You put your candle in a little glass thing so it doesn't spread. I'm not putting my candle in a little glass thing. I'm throwing it 
on Boca Raton. Amen? I'm not scared of the enemy snuffing it out. This flame is chasing them. Oh, don't start it now. What's wrong with you people? Not yet. We have so many things to talk about, me and these people. <clears throat> I had a um, Shabbat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe I read the Bible that the kingdom of heaven is righteous, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That probably looks like something. What do y'all think? Probably doesn't look like the world, yeah? So sometimes people do weird things when God gets on them. We're like, whatever. Hallelujah. So I, I was recognizing that the devil was... Um, Trying to snuff out my little light this week from my God from this weekend. Uh, hashtag fail, yes. And I um, and the anointing came in my office, wow. which was nice. Wow, okay. And the anointing fell in there, and I began to travail in a prophetic tongue. And I knew I was accomplishing something. And sometimes you just got to scream in tongues, amen. Sometimes all your little prayers just don't work. You just got to scream in tongues for a while. You know, we got all kind of workers walking around talking on the phone. I have to hear them all day. They can hear me a little bit. Amen. So I'm just screaming in tongues. I think my wife's having a counseling session next room. I don't care. Screaming in tongues. And then wisdom walked in the room. And supernaturally, the Lord brought me to a prophetic word I got 10 years ago. To the month. It was almost to the day, but... <clears throat> And the Lord said, I'm fulfilling this now. This is going to begin happening. And so I want to share it with you, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Word of God. <clears throat> the Lord said, the Lord said, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> he said, I'm sending a firestorm to the earth. I'm sending a firestorm of my Holy Spirit to the earth. I'm sending a fire. The Lord said, I'm sending a firestorm to the earth, and no man will quench it. For by my spirit, I will birth a work in the earth, the Lord says, and I will draw the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the Father. For I'm raising up an end time army. I'm raising up revivalists, the Lord said, who will know how to carry the spirit of God, the authority of God, who will know how to walk in my presence and affect their surroundings according to my spirit and according to my word. The Lord said, I've been searching for hearts that are after me. For men have used my gifting to build their kingdom, but I long to have a kingdom on the earth. But today the Spirit of the Lord says, I am sending forth my fire on the earth and you will be carriers of my anointing. You will be carriers of my fire. You will be carriers of my word. And I will brand your soul with my very image, the Lord says. I will mark you for me, the Lord says. He says, as for those who follow after me, I'm sending an anointing and I'll send an authority. Today, I'm calling, the Lord says. You have been looking for the call. Today, I am calling. Here is the call. Seek me. Seek me. Walk in my ways. And I will show signs and wonders on the earth. And the Lord says, I will show signs and wonders in you, the Lord says. Can you say amen? I want to pray in that for a moment. So if you would stand with me, I just want us to pray. I want us to agree with what God is doing right now. Sarah had no idea I was going to share this. She probably don't remember that word, but <clears throat> she might have even been saved 10 years ago. Who knows? Um, were you saved 10 years ago? Yes? So you were probably there when I brought the word. We want to, very, we want to guard the words that God gives us. We want to value them. So I want you to pray right now. I want you to pray into those words right now. I want you to pray into a firestorm of God's presence in your life, in your finances, in your... Min no, no, we got to lift our voice. We got to just, we got to tarry a little bit here. We got to tarry a little bit here and the anointing is going to come on you as you begin to pray. We need the firestorm of God, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Send your spirit, Lord. Send your spirit, Lord. Send your spirit, Lord. We value the move of your spirit. And what it right now. He's pouring it out. Who's going to receive it? Come on. Come on, cry out for it. We want it, Jesus, for Boca Raton, for Palm Beach and Broward counties, for South Florida, and to the ends of the earth, Jesus, that you would find a people right here. That you would find a people right here, Jesus. Right here, Jesus. 
Come on, just 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. Jesus, 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 that you would do it in our midst. Move whatever you need to move. Cleanse us from within, Lord. Teach us how to seek you. Teach us how to seek you. And that we would seek your glory on the earth. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Give a clap off if you would. Amen. It's going to happen. Amen. Amen. Have a seat if you would. Hallelujah. Got a Bible. You can turn to Matthew chapter 15. I think I told you that all already. Listen. <clears throat> ha. <clears throat> if we don't understand the purpose, if we don't understand the purpose of the call on our church, we're going to miss it. If we don't understand the purpose of what God is doing in the earth today, we're going to miss it. And that's not hyperbole. That's, that's what we've seen all throughout the scriptures, is that people don't understand the purpose of the call, and they miss it. And we don't want to miss it. I want to come into everything God has for me. I want you to come into everything God has for you, for your family, for the generations that come after you. I, 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 want, I, want, I want us to know it. I want us to leave a mark on the earth. Amen? 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 I, uh, <clears throat> I have this uh, prayer, this desire. Uh, when I'm done here, I don't want them to be able to tell the story of Jesus Christ in Boca Raton without including me. Come on. Come on. I don't want them to be able to talk about this generation without including me. How about you? Come on. I don't want them to tell the story of my neighborhood without me being included. I want to be grafted into God's story on the earth right now. I want to be grafted into his story. And if we don't look for the purposes of God, then we'll completely miss it and we'll wind up doing our own thing and thinking it's all about us and we completely miss God's purposes and we never see them come to pass. And I don't want that to happen. I'm getting older and I don't like to admit it, but I am. And, and, and as you get a little bit older, you think, I don't have as much time in front of me maybe as I have behind me, but I have plenty in front of me, honey. Don't worry about that. I got plenty in front of me. However, at some point, I want to relax. <laughs> now is the time to work, amen, while the sun is up. We need to work while the sun is up, right? Are you with me? I want to accomplish some things. As we look at the, uh, the gospel of Matthew today, I want to kind of unfold, unpack what we're talking about here. Before I get to the scripture, you want me to stand still, honey, turn to take a picture? Okay, hold on. How about right here? Is this good right here? You want an action shot? Come on, you gotta, you gotta help out the wife, amen. The Gospel of Matthew, of course, is the first book in the in the New Testament. It wasn't the first one written. We know this. Mark was the first one written. Many, many people didn't realize that. Much of uh, Mark is kind of the foundation of the book of Matthew. So you'll see, uh, a, like uh, maybe seventy five percent of Mark in Matthew. Stories told a little differently as Holy Spirit had Matthew tell the stories a little differently because Matthew had a different purpose in his gospel. Then Mark did, had a different audience, so he did things a little bit different. He contextualized the gospel a little differently for his audience than Mark did. Just like Jesus contextualized the gospel for the places he went, Paul contextualized the gospel for the places he was writing to. Nothing wrong with contextualizing the gospel as long as we're pointing to Jesus. Now, Matthew was a, uh, a, a Greek-speaking Christian Jew writing Matthew to Christian Jews. He wrote it in Greek. Uh, he most likely wrote it while he was in Antioch, and he wrote it again to the Jews of the age and uh, who were who were believers. And uh, it was in, in his his goal was kind of like to explain the relationship between the Christian church and Israel, to kind of explain the Jewish history of what was happening and show the Jewish Christians of the day how this Jesus thing is not all of a sudden something new. It's what God has always been trying to do. Say amen. amen. It's kind of in three parts. We're going to talk about the first two parts today. The first section is the first 10 chapters of the book of Matthew. And in, and in the first uh, section, what we see is uh, Matthew focuses on Jesus's, Jesus as the Son of God, and he focuses on his messianic call. I know most of you know this. I just want to kind of catch us up here a little bit. Talks about Jesus as the Son of God. Talks about his messianic call. And in this first section, we see Jesus' public ministry begins somewhere around uh, Matthew chapter 5 in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. His ministry kind of goes public. It goes from hiddenness to public. And in the second section, uh, which we're going to focus on 
today starts in verse 11, goes through about midway, excuse me, chapter 11, midway through chapter 16. And what we see in this second section is how Israel is responding to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's better than others. And in this second section, we see uh, what Jesus says. He says, because of the hardness of their hearts in Israel at the time, uh, they were they fail to comprehend the teachings of Jesus. Like they flat out don't understand it. Have you noticed when you're offended, you don't learn as easily as when you're not offended? When you're not as judgment, when you're not in judging someone, it's easier to learn from them than when you're judging people. Because of our hardness of heart, it gets hard to learn. And because of their hardness of heart, they fail to understand the teachings of Jesus. Because of their hardness of heart, they were unable to recognize the miracles as the kingdom of God manifesting in the earth. Because of their hardness of heart, they were offended with his ministry. And eventually, because of their hardness of hearts, they began to plan the murder of Jesus. Now, Cliff notes, this is not how you want to react to Jesus. This is not the reaction you want. When Jesus comes calling, getting offended, failing to understand what he's saying, thinking you already know what he's talking about, wanting to murder him is a bad reaction. Bad reaction, right? What we want is Jesus to come alive on the inside of us so we can grow in our knowledge of him, and that his kingdom can grow within us. Now, in the midst of this, there was always a group of folks who did believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed his teachings, even if they didn't fully understand them, much like me. Uh, they, they, they were his disciples, and they followed him around. And as people experienced God, and they were humble, and they experienced Jesus Christ, they would understand Jesus' call, and they would be grafted into his people. Uh, we know that uh, many of these uh, early disciples were women. And uh, <clears throat> there was this offense. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Thank you for the woo. That's awesome. It makes me encouraged. And so when we get to Matthew chapter 15, which is what we're going to talk about today, in the first half of Matthew chapter 15, I encourage you to read all this. In the first half of Ma Matthew chapter 15, he starts having some real conflict with the religious elite of the day. And they're super offended with Jesus, uh, and they're, they're upset that Jesus' disciples wouldn't perform the ceremonial cleansing rituals before they ate. Uh, and they wanted Jesus to get in on their condemnation. Now, Jesus is never in on the condemnation except for religious folk. And so they were upset with him that his disciples weren't doing the ceremonial cleansings before he ate. And in verses 6 and 7 of Matthew chapter 15, he starts rebuking them. And, uh, and, and he says, listen, your little traditions that you think are making you clean, your, 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 your ceremonial things that you think are God, they're actually making the word of God not work in your life. Not only are they not making you holy, you're being separated of the things that are holy because of the traditions that you made up. Because of your religion, because of your offense, because of the things that you think make you righteous, you're actually less righteous. <clears throat> he argued so strongly with these religious elite, his disciples, as they pulled him aside, and they're like, okay, we've been going along with you all this time, and now we're getting some problems. Why? Why are you so angry? Why are you arguing with them over something so stupid as whether or not we're washing our hands right? And he says, in, verse, in Matthew chapter 15, 10 and 11, he says, basically, he says, they're so worried about what they eat, but what comes out of their mouth is wicked. They're so concerned about what goes in their mouth, they don't even see that what's coming out of their mouth is wicked. And in verse 17 and 18, he says, listen, what you eat, it passes through you and it's gone forever. What comes out of your mouth will make you wicked. They didn't, they didn't understand that. They didn't understand that. And this is where we, we pick up the story in verse 21. What happens is, in verse 21 it says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now, if we don't understand the biblical history, we won't understand how significant this is. Now, Tyre and Sidon are in are north of Israel in today, modern-day Lebanon, right? This is not the promised land. Do you understand that? This is not where they believe Jesus was sent to. Jesus left natural Israel and went into Lebanon. Now, we don't know what he was withdrawing from. The Bible just says he withdrew and went to Tyre and Sidon. What, what was he withdrawing from? Some might think he was withdrawing from the persecution that was coming from the religious elite. Other people believe that he was withdrawing from those who rejected him. 
to go other places? Or is it possible that he was withdrawing himself from the entire religious system they wanted to trap him in to somewhere that would be open to his ministry? We do know that Jesus withdrew and he went into a region of where there were unclean people according to their tradition. And this is a huge turning point in the gospel of Matthew. This is a massive turning point in the New Testament, in the scriptures, in what Jesus went and did. There is a shift there from only ministering to Jews to reaching the Gentiles. Watch this. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 22. Are you there? I'll ask again. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Let's read along in our Bibles. Matthew 15, verse 22, it says, And a Canaanite woman from that region, the region he just went to, came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. Verse 24, But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. If you don't get anything from today's message, if you get distracted by the kids, if you get cold or you get tired or hungry and you check out right now and the Holy Ghost falls on you and you're caught up in a trance for the rest of the service, if you get nothing else from this message, I just want you to get that Jesus heals everyone. I just want you to get that. He heals everyone. If you get none of the theological foundation or that, I want you to hear it. Nobody is excluded. Amen? <clears throat> Amen? All right. <clears throat> this is considered one of the hard sayings of Jesus, and that's hard if you don't know Jesus. I don't find this difficult at all because I've actually met the man Jesus. I've met him, so it's not difficult for me at all. We're going to take a little deep dive in this, and how you view this story is really dependent on how you view God. How you view God and how you view the heart of God. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to possibly challenge what you've heard about this scripture before, and that's okay because I'm a challenger, right? It's, I've taken the test. I'm okay with it. Too many people fall into a pit when trying to exegete this scripture because they focus on the beginning and not the end. When we talk about Jesus, the big point of Jesus' life is the end of the Gospels, that he rose from the dead. Amen? That's the big point of the story. If you get none of the rest of the story right, the fact that he was murdered and rose from the dead is the big part. Amen? How we got there, it's important, just not as important as we understand that he was raised from the dead. He bore our sins and he was raised from the dead and he's alive right now. Would you say amen to that? So when we get caught up in scriptures like this that we don't understand, don't get bogged down in the beginning. Look at the end. And in the end, he healed her. All right, I want you to hear that. All right. So let's take a deep dive in this. And, 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 <clears throat> and I, I'm going to, um, I want to challenge you a little bit, maybe expand how you look at Jesus today. And I think his love is going to be. Some people look at this scripture and they say, wow, this woman, she argued with Jesus and she changed his mind. Have you ever talked to Jesus? Have you ever changed his mind about anything? Do you feel like you've ever taught God anything? Because I'd like to show you what delusion looks like, if that's what we feel happened. We've never changed Jesus' mind ever. He is God. Some people look at this and they're like, wow, Jesus was so astonished at her faith. He was surprised. Can we surprise Jesus, really? Is he really the all-knowing God, and yet he's surprised, like he accidentally stumbled upon this woman and was surprised at the outcome, I would contend that's not what happened either. Some people teach that Jesus learned a new part of his mission here as he went into this region of Tyre and Sidon, as if Jesus didn't know his own identity. I feel like he knew. I've even read commentaries on this that said Jesus wouldn't minister to him because he was trapped by his own racism. I feel like he wasn't racist at all. I kind of feel like Jesus died for the sins of mankind. And other people teach that this woman wore him down. 
if you can wear down Jesus in three sentences, we're all doomed. Because I've been trying his nerve for about 20 years. And I am thankful that he's long-suffering. Aren't you? I am thankful that he's long-suffering in my stupidity. And he didn't say, fine, I'll just do that for you. How many of the things that you prayed for when you first got saved didn't get answered and you're thankful today? Hallelujah that you didn't listen to my stupidity and gave me what I wanted. Okay, if we're going to understand the purpose of Jesus, he's unchanging. We have to understand the story from the beginning. It didn't actually change, but sometimes we got it wrong. Now, God spoke to Abraham way at the beginning, right? As he was calling a people to himself, Genesis 12, he says this over Abraham. We have to get this. We have to get it so we don't miss our mission. Watch this. He says this to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation. That's a plural. He spoke to a man and said, I'll make him a nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you shall what? Be a blessing, right? Now we see purpose. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. And in, let's say it together, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We see purpose here. We see calling. We see what the real mission on Abraham is. See, when God calls you, there is a specific function for your call in society. When God gives you a call, there is a specific function for your call in society, whether he called judges or prophets or kings or priests or evangelists or apostles or entrepreneurs or fathers or mothers. He calls you for a specific function in society. And we can get that super, super confused. We can feel that our calling, our election, if you will, gives us a special status instead of a special function. This is the pit Israel kept falling into. They felt that their election gave them a special status. We are a special people. Doesn't matter what we're doing. And God kept trying to tell them, listen, you have to do what I tell you or you will lose your election. You will lose your special status. You will lose all that because I put you in a status for a purpose. And if you refuse to fulfill the purpose, the status will not be there. Do you understand what I'm saying? God brought Israel out of bondage, redeemed her value for a special purpose. And that special purpose was to bring forth the Messiah on the earth, that all the nations would be blessed through Jesus Christ. There was a special call on the people of Israel, a special call on the Jews, that through their lineage, the Messiah would be born, and then in him, he would carry the sins of the world, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It was the promise in the garden when Satan Cause Adam and Eve to fall. God spoke to the devil and he said to him, listen, through this woman will come a seed and her seed, his heel, will crush your head. That was a prophecy of the Lord Jesus coming and conquering the devil here on earth after he already conquered him in heaven. You hear what I'm saying? There was a special call that was preserved for Israel to bring forth this Messiah. There was a special call. There always was a special call. But the people of God kept rejecting God. There was a history of consistently rejecting God. And so in this context, Jesus is not confused about the story. He's not confused about the purpose. He's not confused about the call. And so he's arguing with these religious people. He's rebuking these religious people. And his disciples are like, what are you arguing with them all the time for? What are you rebuking them over some traditions for? What? Why? Why why do we keep having these? Can you explain it to us in Matthew 15? Can you explain it to us? And Jesus says, Jesus says, listen, all this stuff they're telling people to do, all these traditions, all of this stuff doesn't get anybody closer to God. It's a counterfeit. None of this stuff that they're talking about is what God is doing. And then the Bible says, Jesus takes them. Jesus takes his disciples right after this, explaining to them, none of this stuff is God. And he takes them outside of Israel. 
He takes them to a people, the Canaanites, that historically Israel considers these people dogs. Literally dogs, not even human. It's all over the scripture. And he takes them to a woman that they considered dogs. And here's how I see this story. This is how I see it as I read this and I know the heart of God. I see that Jesus goes with the disciples and the woman is over here yelling, yelling. And if you remember the story, she's yelling, Jesus, my daughter is bound by the devil. She's demon possessed. Please heal her. Now, if you have kids, you know you will do anything for your kids. You'll make a fool of yourself. You'll go to the ends of the earth. You'll scream and you will shout. And anybody who's ever had kids or had nieces, nephews, young people you took care of, you will not let a little one suffer. You'll do what it takes. You'll break religious code. You'll break legal codes. You'll do what it takes, right? Like, I'm protecting mine. And if you don't care about the welfare of a child, we naturally think there is something wrong with you. Are are you with me? It's in this context. We have to remember this context. These are real people in real situations. There's a woman over here screaming out to the disciples. Jesus, heal her. Heal my daughter. She's afflicted. And I see Jesus in the story. The disciples are over here. The woman's over here. Just follow me for a minute. And I see Jesus not talking to the woman. He's talking to the disciples. Read the scripture. It doesn't say he spoke to her. It's not in there. He said he spoke. Didn't say who he was speaking to. So the woman's crying out, and the disciples are like, listen, she's annoying. She's annoying Jesus. Make her go away. Make her go away. And he's staring at the disciples. And he says to them, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He did not. (laughs) He's talking to these disciples. I need you to see this. What are they saying? What are they saying? They're saying, they're saying, this girl, they're not worthy of what you're carrying, Jesus. Make them go away. And Jesus is like, you don't even recognize you're acting just like the people I just rebuked. They were saying that you're not worthy to eat this bread of the kingdom. And now you're saying she's not worthy to receive this bread of the kingdom. And you don't even see it. She's like, I brought you here for a reason. You don't even see it. Here's a woman crying out, my my daughter's demon possessed. Jesus, help her. I'm like, she's a dog. We can't minister to her. That's funny because the religious people thought you were dogs. Funny how this works. So I see him looking at them saying, I was just sent to the lost sheep in Israel, right? And she's screaming out over here. She's screaming out. Jesus, heal my daughter. I'm not called to her, right? What do you think? What do you think I should do right now? Stick to religion or help this woman? What do you think? And she comes down and she actually bows down before him. Verse 25, she bows down and says, Lord, help me. And I see Jesus looking at his disciples again. Next verse, he says, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, right? What do you think we should do? Not good to throw it to the dogs, right? Jesus, why were you arguing with the religious leaders back there? Let me tell you why. There's plenty of the Lord's blessings in the kingdom to go around There are plenty of blessings in the kingdom of God to go around. And these religious leaders were saying, not enough for them. And now his own disciples are saying, not enough for her. And so the lady says to Jesus, she goes, yeah, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall under the master's table. And Jesus said, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. This is so important. 
This is so important that we get this. There's so many false teachings on this scripture. And the false teaching says something like this. If you want to receive from God, you got to be willing for God to insult you and treat you poorly. Like that's anything to do with reality. You have to be willing to be treated poorly to receive from God. you got to be willing for him to insult you and completely lay down his character for you to test you. I thought he already took the test. I thought he, already, he was the one who bore the cross. Ah, that's not what's happening here at all. That's not what's happening here at all. Jesus is not insulting her. This is a rhetorical style where you kind of ask questions and you challenge somebody's belief system. And you put out, uh, you put out a thesis. And you say, well, what do you think about this? And someone says, well, here's what I think about that. And then I say, well, here's what I think about. Which, there's a rhetorical style that was happening back in the day. We have to understand how they spoke and how they wrote. And Jesus is not insulting a woman who wants her daughter healed. What kind of maniac would attack a woman for wanting her daughter healed? Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Not my Jesus. Maybe some false Jesus. Not my Jesus. No. Uh-uh. No. That's not, what, that's not what happened at all. Jesus saying to his disciples, what do you think? What do you think? Think we should listen to the religious leaders? What do you think we should do? Has God ever asked you a question? Do you think he was trying to learn something in that question? It's like, I've just lived for eternity, but I can't solve this one. Duke, help me understand. <laughs> right? Like, right? I feel like he knows. God asks you questions so that you can learn something. So you can find out, watch this, what's inside of you. So you can speak out what's in your heart and you can hear it. Is what's in your heart defiling you or blessing you? He asks us questions so that we can find out what's in our heart. And so here's what, here's what Jesus is asking. Who is worthy of this bread of the kingdom? Now, in this section of Scripture, there's this theme, this, this um, literary uh, thing that they use in the Scripture. This, and, 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 and he uses this bread as a symbol of the blessings of the kingdom of God. Now, before this story, Jesus went and he multiplied the bread he broke it and multiplied it, showing that there is no limitation to the supply of God's kingdom on the earth. Do you hear me? There's no limitation. He multiplies the bread. Then we find out about bread. There's there, and the disciples are eating bread, and the religious leaders say that they're not worthy to eat the bread because they're not receiving it correctly. Now we see a woman who's outside the kingdom, and the disciples say that she's not worthy to eat the bread, but Jesus is like, I'm giving her bread anyways. And then we see after this story, he goes and multiplies bread again. You see, it's called a U-shape uh, structure in, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures. And what it looks like is like this. There's a turnaround in the midst. It starts with multiplying. Who's worthy? Are your disciples? Wow, even she's worthy. Everybody gets more. You get this? Everybody gets a bunch because there's plenty of kingdom. Are these people worthy? Wow, even she's worthy. Let's multiply the kingdom. You, you see what I'm saying? This is the literary device that's used in here to paint a bigger picture. But if you don't read the whole scripture and you get what we call versitis, you get stuck in one verse instead of figuring out what Jesus is trying to talk about. If you don't understand the story, you get versitis. I'm going to stick on the one thing. Oh, she's a dog. If you're not willing to be called a dog, Jesus won't heal you. No, it's just dumb, right? That's, it has no, that's nothing to do with what he's talking about. He's talking about who is worthy of this bread of the kingdom. Who is worthy? He multiplies it. Shows who's worthy. He shows that even the Gentiles are worthy. Then he multiplies it again. This is so important. I need you to get this. Back in the day, this is, this is like, I didn't grow up in antiquity. And this doesn't say it in the Bible. But I, believe, I feel confident in saying they didn't have dog food. I'm, just, I'm confident in saying Purina was not quite around in the days of Jesus. Yet I believe dogs ate. And we know they had dogs as pets because they just referred to one. And so what would the dogs eat? The dogs would eat the same thing we ate. They'd eat, they'd make dinner, and the dogs would get the leftovers. Or we see here, the dogs would eat the stuff that falls on the floor. Now, if you have a small child and you have a dog, cleanup gets easier, right? Now, instead of cleaning all the food, you're just cleaning saliva off the floor, right? It's a little, there's a little benefit here. Are you, are you getting that?
This is important. So Jesus is looking at his disciples. She's a dog, right? He knows what he's saying. She's a dog, right? Can we give the dog this incredible bread that's from the kingdom? And the lady says, even the dogs get to eat what's served in the house. What's she saying? She's acknowledging what God has said from the beginning. The earth is the Lord's and everything on it. There is nobody, there is nobody who are excluded from his kingdom. As many as come will be invited in. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no longer these walls. She's like, listen, the whole family gets to eat of the bread. The people that you think are great and those that you think are dogs. Even the dogs get to eat the food that the master prepares. Even the dogs get to eat this bread of the kingdom. This woman understands the kingdom better than the disciples do. She's like, but everybody in the family gets to eat it. Great is your faith. Great is your faith. Be healed. In the beginning, God said he wanted a kingdom of priests. Priests have to minister to somebody. They have to minister to somebody. And so if Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests, their call was to minister to the world and declare the excellencies of God. This is what the scripture says. That's actually in the Bible. They're called to minister and testify to the excellencies of God. They need to minister to someone. They need to minister that the good news of the Messiah is coming. This rescuer. And he's not just for Israel. He's for all the world. Are, are, are you hearing me? Yeah. And so this woman understands this kingdom view. See, even people who worship other gods, they still belong to God. Because the earth is the Lord's and everything on it. No, 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 no. I worship this God. Actually, you don't understand, but it's not possible. Because that God's not real, right? Like, it's, it's not actually real. I know you say you worship this God, but it's not a real God. There isn't like an economy in heaven, and the gods are fighting over people. Like, there is one God. We understand that, right? And everybody is under God. Many are rejecting him. Many of us have received him. But if your excuse is another God, it's just rejecting, but he's still God. The earth is the Lord's. And this woman understood that. Listen, we're all under one master, and if he's serving bread, my daughter gets some of it. If she's a dog, she still gets some of it. This is super important. This is super important. <clears throat> he says, oh, woman, your faith is great. I want you to search the Bible. Faith is only either a fruit of the Spirit or a gift of the Spirit. Search it. Search the New Testament. It's either the fruit of the Spirit or the gift of the Spirit. But it comes from God. And this woman had it. This woman had it. This woman had it. The one they were saying was outside the kingdom actually had the faith. Understood the kingdom. Welcome the king in and let him do his thing in his daughter's life. Jesus was there on purpose. And so... Jesus, being an amazing discipler, as I can testify. How about you? He's got his disciples there, and he's trying to teach them something on many levels in this season. And he's trying to show them, look, I'm going to send you out into the world one day. You're going to go and do stuff for me. And stuff's going to come up, and you're going to want to fit it in your religious box, and it's not going to work. And I want to show you what it looks like to ask questions. I want to show you what it looks like to wrestle with theology and make sure the heart of God comes through what you're doing. He's like, one day, one day I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh and I'm going to graft in the Gentiles and I need to give you a grid for it right now. I can imagine the conversations that the disciples had. What do you mean he poured the spirit out on the Gentiles? What are we doing there in Cornelius' house? What are you talking about? He's like, hey, you remember that, remember that woman? Remember? Remember? We went to Tyre and Sidon and that Syrophoenician woman was there and Jesus healed her. My God, he's been doing this all along. We completely missed it. 
Jesus is the ultimate disciple, and he's teaching people you have to be flexible and you have to learn. You have to be willing to get your little religious box that you put God in and say, maybe he's doing a new thing in this season, and my religious structure doesn't understand it. I feel like this is a good word. I feel like this is a good word. I feel like this is a good word. Hallelujah. And so it's easy to see this looking back. Looking forward is a little more hard. Because we got religious leaders today telling us who is not in the church. Turn on news, you'll find out who's not a Christian by these religious leaders. And they don't want us to associate with them. Don't associate with these political foes because they're also the foe of Jesus. I feel like I saw that in the book. And I'm not going to be fooled. I'm not going to be fooled. We, as the church of Jesus Christ, cannot be scared to associate ourselves with people that the religious tell us are unclean. We can't. Because when we draw that line between us and them, Jesus is always on the other side of that line. Every time he's on the other side of that line. These people are away from God. They are awful. They're terrible. They're away. Well, Jesus is like, I'm actually here with them. I'm, I'm, I'm actually over here with them. I need you to hear what I'm saying and understand what I'm not saying. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm not talking about Every maligned group is saved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we don't get to judge who is with him and who's not. Yeah. We don't get to do it. We need to reach them. You need to find out who you hate and say, that's probably where Jesus is moving right now. I need to go there. I need to go there. Who are the dogs? I need to go there. Let's finish up with this. Whoever's doing music, would you come up? Come on. All three of you. I got a, I got a, got a three-part harmony going to be on the keys there. That's awesome. Told Kelly her stomach's getting so big she could dial a phone with it now. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? I love you, Kelly. That'd be awesome. I just rest food on it while watching TV. This is perfect. Watch this. Peter, Peter got this. Peter got it. In writing his letter, 1 Peter. 2, verse 9, he says, I need, he's like, I need you to understand who the kingdom is. He says, you are a chosen race, you believers in Jesus Christ. You are a royal priesthood. Priests need to minister to somebody. You are a people for God's own possession. So that you, here's the purpose. Ready? Here's your purpose. Stand with me. Here's the purpose. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Have you been called out of darkness yet? Have you been called out of darkness yet? Have you been called out of darkness yet? Listen, if you're not sure, we're going to get, you know, we're going to have people right here at the front. And today you can come out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Pray a prayer and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Recognize that you're living in His kingdom. You need to recognize the King. It's pretty much that simple. But those of us who've been called out of darkness have a purpose. And it's to proclaim the goodness of God. It's to tell people our story. Tell people the story of what God did in our life. To tell people the story of what God has been doing from the beginning of time. To tell people the story of how beautiful Jesus is, how much he loves the hurting and the lost and the sinner and the broken and the wicked. He loves them so much that he came and died on a cross for them. We need to tell them. Come on. If you want to clap for Jesus, clap for Jesus. Come on. But we have a ministry, and that ministry is to tell this story. And if we don't recognize this purpose, we're going to miss it. I want you to covenant in your heart with me today that we're not going to miss it. And we are going to proclaim his story that we will not miss the purpose. In Jesus' name, thank you. Come on, give it up for the word this morning. I just feel right now just the, the compassion of the Lord stirring in my heart. I believe he's just moving in the room because he stands with the forgotten. 
He stands with the hurting. He stands with the orphan. He stands with the widow. He stands with the broken. Come on, he stands with the lonely. My Bible says that he takes the solitary and puts them into family. My Bible said that he took stripes, that he took a beating, that he took lashes for the healing of people who don't even care about him. He did it anyway. I want to tell you this morning, church, that you, you've got something to proclaim. That's what it says, to pro- proclaim the excellen- uh, excellencies of him who has called you. Have you been called this morning? I'm going to ask again, church, have you been called this morning? Then you've got something to proclaim. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got something to give. You've got something the world needs. They need your story. They need what Jesus has done in your life. Come on, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know who the hurting is in your life. I don't know who the hurting people are. I don't know who, who the lonely are. I don't know who the afflicted are, but I got to tell you, he's got something that he's given you that you need to give them. So this week, we're going to go proclaim his excellencies, amen? We're going to take an invitation card when we leave, and we're going to look for people who need the gospel of Jesus. And we're going to invite them to church, and the Holy Spirit is going to touch their life, and they're never going to be the same again, amen? Can we do that, church? Can we actually, can we go be the church? Uh, We're all about breaking some religious boxes here. So, so you find the person that, that, that religion says isn't worth it, and you go, you go tell them that, hey, Jesus says they are. Amen. That Jesus actually says they are, and he died for them. Come on, can we give it up for Jesus one more time this morning? We love you guys. God bless you guys. Say hello to somebody you didn't come with today, and we'll see you guys next week. Have an amazing Sunday. God bless you.